What's up, guys? Thanks for watching the podcast. I truly, truly appreciate it. I would really appreciate a like and a subscribe from you. That helps the YouTube channel grow. And I wanted to drop in and remind you one more thing. If you have any friends, family, or anyone you know looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, please have them call me. Get in touch with me via email at blake at blakebaker.net or on Instagram at blakebakerrealestate. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Under Contract Podcast. All right, you want to give me a mic check real quick? Yes. There yes. we go. All right. Yeah, just hold it somewhat close. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Under Contract Podcast. This is our first remote podcast I've ever done, and I appreciate you having me to y'all's beautiful office here. Uh, back again with Mr. Ronnie Matthews of the now EXP Realty, uh, Ronnie and Kathy Matthews Group. The last time, let me grab my notes here. The last time we did we did a podcast, it's already been two years, if you can yeah. believe that. Yeah, uh, yeah, April 14th, 2022. Okay. And our last podcast was all about, there's no inventory, 50,000 over asking price, a lot different of a situation than we're dealing with now. And I was just curious as to what you are seeing out there and what your thoughts on the market now, what we're going to see over the next five years, stuff like that. You know, it's very interesting. Real estate always changes. Business always changes. No matter what business you're in, it's constant change, change, change. We've seen some big extremes over the past five years. You know, prior to COVID, real estate market's good. Interest rates extremely low. COVID hits. We think the world's going to end. And the real estate market gets stronger than it had ever been. And then it just keeps changing. Uh, Like you say, when we met, I mean, the problem was getting a listing and then if you got a listing, you knew it was going to sell, and it's going to sell for more than asking price almost for sure. Here we are two years later. Now the inventory is growing, and sales are slower. Prices are still staying firm, which is uh, a little bit surprising, but that'll start softening too, and we are seeing some. You see some prices being reduced. You see some houses sitting on the market and actually expire and list with another agent, which never happened the previous three, four years. Yes. Uh, so we always have to adapt, and that's what we know. And as far as what's going to happen in the next five years, I don't know. I mean, truthfully, it's one of those, what will happen with interest rates? That's obviously a big thing. What will happen with the economy? That's a big thing. What will happen with the election? That's a big thing. Those are three major things that can change everything. Um, I think as far as, the obviously, the election will be over in a few months. Hopefully it goes the way I want it to. But, uh, you know, that's we're going to work through it no matter what. No matter who's president, real estate's still going to sell. The U.S. is not going to fall apart in the next four years or the next 20 years. Can it be a less safe place to live? Can it be a less safe uh, business environment? Of course. If taxes get raised tremendously, then that's a problem. If more and more people keep coming in across the border, that's a problem. Uh, if Agreed. interest rates, I don't... I don't really see interest rates dropping much, to tell you the truth. Uh, I don't think we'll ever see two and a half, three percent interest rates again. I agree. It's just, you know, it was a, a unique space in time. I got in real estate in 1988, rates were 11%. A couple years later, they dropped under 10, and I thought, wow, this is great. We got real estate interest rates under 10%. Now, home prices were much less. My first year in 1988, my average sales price was 51000 Right. 51000 you know. Same house nowadays is 280 yep. type thing. So it's part of the fact real estate market changes. You know, I had an agent call me uh, from Canada. She's from Kingston, Ontario. And she said, she called me, she said, Blake, I, I know you do some commercial stuff. I'm looking for a commercial agent in Houston because the Trudeau administration has just raised their capital gains taxes to 66%. That's crazy. And she said, all of my investors I work with, my hotel people, any, any, any commercial investment people, they're cashing out yeah. and coming to the United States. They're coming to Florida. They're coming to Texas. Yep, yep. I mean, just think about that. If you take the risk and you go out and you build something, and if it fails, your money's just gone. Mm-hmm. The, the government's not there to bail you out, at least most of us. And... But there, if I'm successful, if I build something good 
and I go to sell it, they want two thirds and they didn't do anything for it. Nothing. And that's hopefully we never see any kind of numbers like that. Uh, you know, some people say 20% is too low. It's really 23.8 with some of the other taxes. Uh, it's been as low as 15. It's been as high as, you know, 35% or whatever it was. Uh, those are numbers you can live with, but 66% is crazy. But correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, so the corporate, Trump lowered the corporate tax. Yep. So taxes were the lowest they had been, I don't know about ever, but in a long time. However, it jump-started the economy so much that he, they collected more tax revenue than they had ever collected yep. with a lower rate. Yeah, when Ronald Reagan was president, he lowered uh, income tax substantially for business and personal. And what happened? Revenue jumped tremendously. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, government spending grew even faster. And when Trump cut... Uh, property taxes, guess what? The next year set revenue uh, records in that the IRS collected more money Mm -hmm. from income tax than they ever had. Now, unfortunately, spending jumped big again. And, of course, COVID relief and a lot of those things came into play too. It's sad, but no one in government wants to cut spending. They'll talk about it, but no one in government wants to cut spending. And and one day that's going to be a problem. The good news is the U.S. is still the strongest economy. Every government has lots of debt, and we're still the strongest currency. We're still the strongest uh, country. Uh, so, therefore, we can keep selling debt, but when do we not? When are we not able to? And that's when the reckoning will happen. Where's the tipping point, right? Because somebody was – I heard the other day that our national debt service is more than our military budget now. Well, and at these interest rates, you know, compared to – when treasuries were, you know, at two percent, and now they're at five, well, the interest carry just two and a half times, just increased by two and a half times. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. Um, just to, I, I have this later in my script here, but while we're on the subject, I, um, I was, I'm always looking for deals, right? Just I cruise LoopNet and CoStar just to see what's out there. Yep. And I have a background in self-storage. That's I, I managed a, sor- a storage facility before I got into real estate. So I know the business. So I'm always looking to see, if, you know, maybe there's something out there. Well, you know, I was looking at this facility that was being marketed. It was uh, in Kingwood area. And they were like, you know, it's a $3.5 million facility. We're going to market th- and they're marketing this on the flyer. It's like a four cap. Yeah. Yeah. And I say, hmm, okay. So well, am I going to go put my money into this storage business where there's not crazy risk, but risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got, it's just going to consume a lot of my time. Yep. Uh, it's not mailbox money. Like everybody thinks it is. I mean, it is to an extent, but you, you have to keep an eye on the place. Yep. Trust me. Yep. Or can I go down to the bank, open a five and a half percent CD and say, see you later. And that CD is never going to call me with problems. Nope. Uh, it, it just seems upside down right now. Yeah. And, you know, whenever you get to those three, four, five million dollar price points, one point on interest is huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, that payment swings. Yeah. Yeah. Commercial deals, you know, I own uh, portions of three different apartment complexes. And there are big complexes, new complexes that were built. And, and I invested quite a bit of money in them because apartment complexes were booming and, and everything going up, 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 and rents going up, up. But in the past year, uh, that suddenly changed because interest rates have jumped so much that suddenly you can't sell our apartment complex that we thought we were going to sell for $55 million and be gone last year, and now we're still sitting on it. And the rents have kind of leveled off. So, you know, our returns are not the same just from rental returns coming in. Okay, we can make distributions, but they're small compared to the amount of money that we have invested. So, you know, I'm hoping that in the next 12 months, I can get out of all those apartment complexes and just take my cash back and look at other things to do with it. I'm not going to invest in long-term commercial properties again, maybe in my life. Well, at your age, I mean, it's yeah. when you, at your age. At my age, you, what do you mean? Well, I mean, <laughs> what I'm saying is you would, I would have a different game plan than you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I mean, that's, and that's something that perfect. I mean, a great comment because we always have to be evaluating where we put our money, what we do, how we invest, and for how long a term we look for. I mean, truthfully, if somebody would come along and say, you know, 
guaranteed, no chance of loss, no chance at risk. Ronnie, take all your cash and put it, I can lock it up for 5% for the next 20 years. I'd be very tempted to do that with a big chunk of it because then that I could easily live off of just my income from that with no risk, no anything else. But I think you like a little bit, like you'd probably put a good chunk of it, but you'd yeah, want to gamble I with do all of it. <laughs> no, <laughs> Got to tr- have no, a little risk in I there. I mean, you know, I, of course, I sold the title company. Yeah. And I retired from it March 1st was my last day at Great American Title Company. And so now people say, well, retired, retired. I was like, I'm not retired. I'm unemployed. So my word is I'm unemployed. You were cracking me up the other day when you said, how many cups of coffee am I supposed to have? I've just been at the house all morning. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this this dude ain't cut out for this, no. man. I've always been. I walked out the door this morning at 6 a.m. That's my normal. And it has been my normal. Well, there was a time in life when I was in construction, my normal time to leave the house at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. Yep. Once I got into real estate, then it's like, man, I got to sleep till. 5.30 or 6. Yeah. When I first got into real estate, I would call people at 7 a.m. and I was waking everybody up. It's mm-hmm. like, what the heck? What's everybody doing? Yeah. Uh, but I'm just, I, I like to start early and end late. I had a guy call me the other, or he texted me at, uh, it was like 8. And he said, hey, Blake, I have a question about your listing at blah, blah, blah. Well, I meet it within five seconds. Hey, this is Blake. You call. He goes, man, you're not like those other realtors, are you? I said, what do you mean? He said, they're all asleep right now. I said, man, it's eight o'clock. You got to be yeah. up and at them. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I've always, people ask me when I've talking to realtors and things, what's the secret? Well, the secret is get up and go to work. Yep. I mean, that's not the secret they want, but there is, if I had a magic secret, shoot, I would have never sold real estate. I'd be selling my secret. Yeah. You know, it's get up and go to work. And answer the phone. And yeah. Answer, return phone calls. Yep. And of course, text. And emails, and of course, nowadays, in my early days, we only had phone calls to deal with. Mm-hmm. Now it's text and email and everything else, or yeah. pages. We had pagers. And How old were you when you quit construction? Because you had a plum. I remember on our last podcast, you yeah. said you had a plumbing company, and the re- the recession happened. All your people you were working for went out of business, and they just couldn't pay you, and yep. you just said, we got to do something else. Yep. How old were you when you said, let's get into real estate and started full-time? October 1987 is when I closed the plumbing utility business, so we had a pretty big company. I had... 69 employees at Dang. 1985 when Kathy and I got married. So 1985 when Kathy and I got married, I was 31 years old, pretty well on top of the world, I thought. Had a great business, doing great, even though the economy in Houston was starting to slide in the U.S. Uh, it suddenly, I was working with good contractors, but they all went out of business. And, you know, I got beat out of several million dollars and woke up in October 87, and the last general contractor went out of business, owed me 800 something thousand. And that was just one of many, and that was 1987. So 800000 still a lot of money, but it was really a lot of money in 1987. So, you know, we looked around. I dropped out of high school. Kathy had one year in college. We didn't have any specialty. So it's sort of, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. And like everyone, I'd seen the ads. Uh, Steve Ernst was a REMAX realtor back in those days and a good producer, and he would mail out things, and I'd see, wow, he sold 50 houses last year. And I look at 50 houses and think, wow, 50 houses times 3%, he's making a lot of money. And, you know, you don't realize all the costs that are involved in it. You see that top line. Yep, you just see that. And just like today, and, you know, uh, hey, real estate's fun. And who doesn't like to look at houses? Who doesn't like to go out with people and show around and look at houses? That's not a job. That's fine. You're opening doors. That's all you're doing. That's it. Exactly. So it, uh, and we had more sense to realize that, but a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people really think real estate's easy. So 1988, we got in real estate. At that time, I was, Kathy and I both were 34 years old. My age now. That makes me feel good. And you've been able to do all that, everything you've done. And here's a perfect example, Blake. When I was your age... My net worth was negative 500000 <laughs> Yeah, Because yeah. I owed a bank from when I closed down the company 500000 Yeah. I signed a note. I agreed I was going to pay it, so I paid it. It took me five years later to finally get it paid off. But so I see a lot of you young guys, friends that I talk with and things that way, every one of you are way ahead of me at your age as far as in the real estate world. It just shows you what's possible. Yeah. And working hard, being honest with people, uh, being knowledgeable. Um, What do we really have to sell except service and knowledge? And that's why, as real estate agents, we need to be professionals. And there's a lot of realtors that aren't. Couldn't agree more. Uh, That perfectly segues me into my next kind of question here. So, you know, I'll I'll be dead honest. This market turn 
Yes. My first quarter, I was number two at my office, but I've never had a quarter where I felt more like I was slowly being strangled to death. Mm-hmm. Yep. And when I missed, I, I was out doing something and uh, Kimberly, I think she texted me and said, hey, you were number two for the quarter. I said, what? Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. This next quarter, it was scary. Yeah. I mean, it had me questioning waking up in the middle of the and night. you got married and you had a baby coming. Exactly. No, baby literally, yeah. a baby was born right in the middle of that quarter. So That'll make it scary. I, was, I mean, the good side of it is I wasn't very distracted. I could really focus on him. But it had me man, like yeah. questioning myself. Like, what yeah. what, am, what am I doing wrong that yeah. um, it's it just seemed like it had to just stop. And it made me realize from... 2017 to 2020 that was my first three years in the game it was such a well-balanced market that anybody could hop in they could do 15 20 deals a year which is what i did and then when covid came i doubled Mm -hmm. over from 19 to 20 i doubled and then i kind of did a little less the next year but then i kept i was growing and i was like man did i get a false sense of confidence because this market had just stopped me in my tracks for a little bit. And now this last, these last two weeks, I've, I say the last two weeks, these last two months, I would say I've really, I've listened to this book and I've really changed my whole game plan as to what I'm doing with my business. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what did you learn in the down times? Because I, I'll admit I got lazy mm-hmm. because you could yep. just stick a sign in the yard. Yep. Uh, I, you know, was getting listings, um, you know, doubled in a year, you're, you can't help, but it, and it was also coming so fast and I'm just a single agent. I don't have an assistant or anything. So I didn't have like a lot of time to keep prospecting. Mm-hmm. Now I look back and I'm like, man, if I would have had an assistant and if I would have kept prospect, I'd be double where I was. So lesson learned, right? You know, um, it's really taught me this, this market, the lesson I'm trying to learn with this, I'm not going to look at it as woe is me, uh, and, and get down on myself. I'm going to say, look, this is a lesson. How can I learn from this and grow? This will be the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm tightening ship. I'm not letting the stuff fall from the fall through the cracks that I would have before because I just had so much other stuff going on. I didn't care. Well, now we can't afford to like let things slip. So, I mean, I'm, you obviously lost a plumbing company. You've seen mm-hmm. the down times. Yeah, You've seen the yeah, bad times. So what are some things that you learned in those down times? Well, I think in good, you know, in good times, we all look like geniuses. In bad times is, you know, and I had a friend that was in the title business, and he said, Ronnie, as a, and they were a big publicly traded company, he said, we, when we made our biggest mistakes was in the dynamic markets, when the markets were booming, because yeah. we hired too many people, we overpay, we get locked into all these, this fat, and then suddenly the market changes, like, oh, my God, what have we done? So, you know, the what we always know is – Things are never going to stay the same. And I always took the attitude, the market may be down, but we should be up. Because never, ever stop marketing, first off. No matter, and that's so many realtors over the years, I've seen them where they have a great year, and then they have a bad year. And a great year, and a bad year. And or and then by the third down bad year, they're out of business and things. Because they can't take it. Income-wise, they can't afford it, you know, those types of things. So, one, we got to manage our spending always. So, in the boom years, don't go spend everything you're making because it may not always be that way. Luckily, I didn't do that. Yep, that's good. That's smart because too many people do. Always pay your income tax because that's another thing that's got many a realtor and many self-employed people in trouble is they're booming they spend the money and they forget about paying quarterly taxes. And then lo and behold, April 15th comes. It's like, God, oh, that much money. I don't have it. And then the penalties and interest kick in and then you've got a problem. So, you know, we have to live within our means always. And that means not only not spend everything we make, save money, put money back. And over time, then that money, put that money to work, creating income and creating streams and that's sort of like what we did from the real estate business to starting a development company with a partner and developing subdivisions and we've now developed over 25 subdivisions and then starting the title company and all of those things but I created income and then I took it and saved it and partly that's from going through the 80s as an example and even in the 80s yes I saved money but 
you know, over time, if you get beat out of, and I think it was over $4 million that we didn't get paid for work we'd done, paid all of our bills, but it just came, you know, what I'd put away, I kept putting back in the company, and one day there was no more to put back. So, you know, it's one of those things. Save, live within your means. Don't just assume it's always going to be better because it's not always going to be better. There's going to be hiccups along the way, and you got to be prepared for them. Never, ever, ever quit marketing. You know, it doesn't matter how much business you've got. You have to have a marketing budget. You have to spend some time or have someone that's concentrated on marketing for you. That leads me to my next question. All right. It's like you've read this before. <laughs> uh, so uh, this this book, 10X is easier than 2X. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's actually a pretty new book. Yep. You were the first guy I thought of because you've built, I mean, you built a plumbing company. You've built your, and you, by the way, you're the only guy I've ever heard heard every time you talk about real estate you don't say oh i had a brokerage or oh i wasn't you say i had a real estate company because yep. you, you treated it like a company yep. that's right it was a business yeah always a business. great american title your development you've gone 10x in everything i've seen you do right so this book 10x is easier than 2x i'll just go ahead and read this paragraph i wrote last night right. so yeah you're the first guy that came to mind when i started listening to this book and for people who don't know what 10x is easier than 2x is it is a book about how to go 10x in your business and life in general, basically stating that going 10x actually requires less effort than going 2x. So, for example, me and my business um, up till now, you know, I'm working on referral. Uh, so me going 10x rather than doubling, doubling would require me to just handwrite notes all day, every day, asking people for referrals. You work harder, you work harder, you work harder, 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 harder yep. burnout, burnout. <laughs> hate the business eventually. Yep. So going 10X requires less effort than 2X. Some of the principles include hyper-focusing in on the things that will grow your business and only those things and shedding uh, the distracting duties that hold you back. So for an example, you don't see Elon Musk at the Tesla factory uh, on the assembly line working on cars. You had 12 title company locations. You weren't at the front desk collecting earnest money checks. Um so working harder is not always necessarily better. Right. How can we translate that into the real estate world? And I mean, what I've found so far is my mission after reading this book is how can I grow my business? I want listings. How can I get more listings? I need to have as many conversations with pr people who own property as possible. I mean, down to its purest form, I need to talk to as many property owners as I can. There's a couple ways you can do that. I have found that calling them directly on the phone, like if I have a listing, I'll call every house. Hey, this is Blake with Remax. I saw my sign down the street. I uh, got this new listing. I didn't know if you knew anybody that might be interested or if there's anything in the world I could do for you. And you'll call 100 people and you'll get 90 no answers, five you don't even want to know what they say. And then five, <laughs> yeah, no, not right now, but here, take my information. And they go on my database. Yep. So that's what I'm doing. Yep. Um, what are some ways that agents can hyper-focus in on that? And maybe some stuff you did, because I don't know if you were like a cold caller guy or if you hired people to do that. What What are some some things that you would recommend? Yeah, I was never a cold call person. I couldn't take the rejection of those five I'm, people that, it just, hurts. that tell you. I mean, I just wasn't. Uh, I'm afraid I'd go home and crawl in bed or something. But uh, So I never did cold calls. But it was always get the name out, get the name out. <clears throat> and, you know, we we were able to stand out early on. And, this you know, social media has changed everything. But in the early days, running Kathy Matthews, and we had the Texas shirts, and Kathy had the big hair. And so we marketed, and we were one of the first – couples to both be in real estate at the same time that wasn't something that was normal back in our starting days because you needed a regular real income <laughs> and benefits and things that way and then you had the other one that said okay let's go into real estate and a lot of it was housewives that you know kind of could work part-time or at least they thought you can't be successful working in this business part-time first off uh, and and really if you think about it for the, your customer consumer it's not even fair to them that, okay, I'm a part-time agent and, well, I can't do it today or tomorrow. But I'll call I, you when I get off. I'll call you when I get off or I can't take calls before five uh, and all of those things. 
when we're working for a client, we're their professional. We're the ones that they're looking to to give them good advice. That they're, We're the ones that are always supposed to be in front of things, not behind it. They shouldn't have to be chasing us for answers. We should be in front of them all the time. Building things, you know, the biggest and most important way to build things is to leverage, first off, your clients that you've worked with, happy clients, getting them to refer you business, staying fresh in their mind, uh, asking them for, you know, if you don't ask them for referrals, then they don't think about it a lot of time. I mean, there are people that are always thinking about it and always thinking about, well, you did a great job, I'm going to tell everyone. But most people, they're busy in their own life, and if they hear someone's thinking about selling, they don't think about saying, wow, you know, Blake Baker did a great job for me. I need to tell these people, you need to call Blake. I need to call Blake and say, Blake, call these people. Because they're busy with their own life. Yep. So we have to work with them and constantly reinforce that with our previous clients. That, hey, you know, I did a great job for you. You know I took good care of you. You know I helped you. You know I was better than almost anyone else. So, you know, if you have someone that's thinking about buying or selling, would you be sure and recommend me? Yep. Uh, you know, I know you used to have the the uh, today's real estate think about Blake Baker's Baker for you know that is hilarious that you say that because that is everywhere I go if I see somebody I haven't yep. seen in a while yep. they'll walk up to me and literally say this is your daily rem reminder to mention yeah. Blake Baker yeah. it's so I mean it's kind of it's the most low level thing you could say <laughs> it's but cheap it sticks That's right. you got to, they have to have something to remember you for I don't know how many real estate agent license agents in the Houston area 70,000 or some big number uh, and there's, you know, lot, lot less than 70,000 houses sell in a year. So that means one per agent, except thankfully for successful realtors, half of those don't sell any houses per year. And then there's others that sell one and two, which is mainly their brother, their sister, their mother, their dad, themselves. And then after that, then you got the other top 20%, like in any business, that are the producers, the ones looking at it. So I think it's consistency somehow getting your name out there where they remember it like yours like at ours it was running kathy matthews and the texas shirts and the, and kathy's big hair uh you know that was now over the years she i have a lot less hair but she has a lot lot less hair <laughs> yeah. she's thick but it's still you know it's this short instead of being that big yeah like it used to be from a good old pasadena just in a city girl yeah up. yeah uh, so the number one thing is just always you, you got to always be marketing Mm -hmm. You've got to always be thinking of ways to get business. No one can call you if they don't know you. Yep. So you've got to get your name out there consistently and over and over and over and over. So when you say get your name out there, do, so, I mean, just when it comes to branding, I mean, are you thinking billboards? I mean, did y'all, y'all did a lot through mail. Mail, I don't think is as effective as it used to be. Agree. Um, but, you know, for those realtors that think, you know, I used to be this guy where, man, they don't want to hear from me. They're busy, this and that. And, eventually this down market said, you know what, I, I have to kind of just nut up and, and make these calls. Yep. And my first call session, I, so I do two hour call sessions that mentally that's about all I got. Yeah. And then I got to go, I got to go drive around or something. Yeah, I got to exactly. get out of the house. Yeah. But I have, I mean, I got a couple hundred past clients at this point, you know, yep. and I went down my list and it ended up taking me three call sessions to get through everybody because I had a bunch of short, hey, how you doing? Oh, we're good. Yeah, thanks for calling. And we're going to, you know, just, you know, a little three, four, five minute conversations. But there was a couple, man, how are you doing? Yeah. 40 minutes goes by yeah. and they're just talking and they want to hear from you. Yeah. I mean, and even yeah. some cold calls, yeah. if you get the right person, you can't get them off the phone. Mm -hmm. They want to talk real estate. So what are you seeing in the market? And I might do this. And yeah, take my information. I got uh, randomly got in contact with a guy the other day who was from Pasadena. His kids went to the school that I graduated from. He knew my principal, my history teacher, yeah. an hour conversation. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. an investor. Yeah. He owns several properties. So Perfect. you just, you never know. No, you don't. And that's, you have to get your name out there. And it's times have changed since I did. Yes, we did a lot of mail outs. Uh, I would still do some mail outs, if nothing else, to those 300 past clients, you know, just to keep your face in front of them. You got to touch them several times a year, basically. Doesn't always have to be a phone call. But, you know, if you think about it, when you're selling somebody's house, now it's a little different in COVID when houses sold so quick, you never, sometimes you never really got to know your people. 
But in times when the market's lower, you really get to know your people. Buyers, you really get to know. If they're in your car for a day or two, then you get to know them. You become a friend. They think of you as a friend. And then suddenly, as soon as the deal closes, they never hear from their friend again. It, it's sort of like, ah, you know, they just kind of use me. I called a lady one neighborhood over from me. There's a, it's kind of sounds like where you live, where there's like five acre big mm-hmm. tracks in a house. Well, I saw expired 1.3 million. And I said, I'm going to call them. So I called this lady. I said, uh, Hey, Miss Wilkes. She said, yeah, who's this? I said, this is blood and went through my spiel. And, uh, I said, I saw your house was on the market and it looks like it had come off the market. I was just trying to figure out what was the situation with that property. She said, no, we bought this property six months ago. It was like a, an error in the, in the, in the database. I said, Oh man, I'm sorry. I guess I was looking for the person who sold it and everything. And, you know, I was ready to hop off the phone. Mm -hmm. She started talking. Yeah, you know, we bought this place and we come from South Carolina and, you know, none of the neighbors have come over to talk to us. And, and she went on this whole spiel by the end of the phone call. Okay. Oh, big point. I said, well, you know, Hey, five, 10 years from now, you sell that place. You have an agent you work with in this area. She said, yeah, we do. This girl we worked with when we bought this place, she was phenomenal. Her name is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I forgot her. And I, I can't remember her name. And I thought, you just yep. bought a $1.3 million home with this person yep. and you don't know her name. And the agent hadn't followed up with you since. And you know what she said at the end of the phone call? She said, well, hey, come by and uh, put a card in my mailbox and shoot, come knock, come talk to me. Come over and see me. Yeah. Inviting me to her house yep. to come see her. Yep. I'd never talked to this lady. I, this was a cold call. Yep. Yep. It just shows you, I mean, as far as, and it's not easy always following up. And especially when your database becomes 3,000, well, then you're not going to be able to call every one of them every year. Right. So you got to think about the long term, too, as far as how do you grow, how do you build, how do you create a scenario where you can stay in touch with those people forever. Yep. And, uh, and that's something we always were pretty good at. Obviously, at one point, it got to, when I sold the real estate company, I think we had more than 15,000 previous clients. Golly, now, more than the town you were born in. Yeah, well, well <laughs> matter of fact, that's, yeah, yeah. We never quite broke 20,000, and, and that included babies, children, and everything, and prisoners. But, uh, uh, but yes, it was, it, 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 I never did fully master that. It was always, I tried to hire and call, you know, a call specialist and things that way. But it's hard for anyone. I mean, there are people that are cut out for it, and I never found that right person that can yeah. just make calls and talk all day, every day on the phone. That's not me. I'm not bashful about talking, but I like to get up and move around. I like to meet with different people. I like to go do something. I like to get outside. So, But you have to create a system. And how that works for everyone is slightly different. Your personality is different than mine. Kathy is much better at meeting strangers and making cold calls than me. So she could actually do that and connect with people. For me, if I called somebody and said, well, what do you bother me for? You know, hang up. Yeah. That's what they would do. But with, with Kathy, and obviously you've got that talent too, is being able to call and connect with somebody out of the clear blue. Yeah. So I don't know if you know who Ricky Carruth is. He's with EXP also. He was one of the guys that moved from Remax to EXP, but he's from Gulf Shores, Alabama. And he his system pretty much, he so his, his kind of story was he started in real estate in 2002 in the boom. 20 years old, made a million dollars driving a Cadillac and then over leveraged on a bunch of like rentals and stuff. When the crash happened, he lost everything. He was sleeping in his car, eating out of people's refrigerators type thing. And in 2000, I guess it was like eight or nine, he got back in the business. So he, he's a big cold caller guy. So what his system is, is he makes calls. He, you know, you get somebody on the phone that y'all click and you know, you can have a conversation the end of the phone call you just say hey well i'd love to stay in touch can i just get an email address you get their email you put them in your database yep. and then every one day a week i do it on fridays but i send a weekly email out and it's just market information just whatever i feel is interesting mm-hmm. so they get yep. that every single friday forever yep. and again like you were saying not everybody's going to have the time to sit there and follow up with every single person yep. but this is a way that you know to keep your name in front of people and like, for example, I sent one a couple of weeks ago of a new listing I have and a buddy of mine who he, uh, on Instagram, he said, Hey, put me in your, your email. So he started getting my email. Hey, new listing in Lake Houston. He, uh, 
text me immediately. Hey, what's the deal with that new listing? I saw your email. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, it works. Yeah. So yeah. that's just like an example of one thing that's I do. The, that's the, you know, nowadays it's sort of like if I were starting out as a realtor and you've got Facebook and all of those things and you have friends. Well, most real estate agents, if you look at who their friends are, they're other realtors. Well, I would build my whole database on no realtors because why do I want every realtor to know what I'm doing? But what if they post a listing and you have a buyer for their listing? Uh, that's I've heard. That's one I've heard. I've got MLS. So, yeah, exactly. You know, but and and I'm not active in real estate sales or any of those things. So you know, in the title business now, I wanted all my friends to be realtors, and I'm terrible on social media. Period. And I've thankfully came along just just ahead of it enough that I didn't ever have to get good at it. And yeah. now I'm, I'm with EXP. I'm trying to learn a little bit, and maybe one day I'll have an Instagram page. Who knows? Just but don't. I'm just, telling you. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not the way I did things. Mine was more hand-to-hand. You know, That's the way I like to do it. Get the word out. Yes, billboards, we had a lot of them uh, over the years, and, and they were very effective for us, but they're very expensive. So I offset that by... I'd find a piece of land that I liked. I'd buy the land, mm. put a billboard on it, and then over time end up selling it, selling the land and making money that way. Our developments, you know, over the years, as we were developing subdivisions, we'd have frontage, and I'd put up a billboard. Uh, I bought on one of my very, very first one that we owned, there was uh, Glenlock Farms was a new community built, built in spring off of Spring Cypress. And an acre of land came up with a mobile home on it right across the street. I bought it for 75000 I put up a billboard right away. And three years later, I sold the land for 150000 But part of my deal with selling the land is I got 15-year free lease for my billboard. Paid for itself because times 10. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have sold it for that amount if I had to move my billboard. But the billboard's still over there now, and it's been 20-something years. The guy that bought it sold it to somebody else, and nothing's ever been. There's a rock yard, a rock landscaping yard on yeah. it. But the sign's still up, and as far as my old office still pays a small amount every year. But that was a great investment. Not only did I make 75000 I got free advertising, you know, for 20-something years. Now. And I just paid ten grand for one for the year. Yeah. Yep. So And that's it. And so we had one right here in front of our office, you know, this was a part of the land we developed, the, the neighborhood behind us. And we had a little sliver of land that came here, so it made perfect to build our office and had a billboard there. Now there's an electronic sign. I've got a, on 2978 right at Spring Creek, uh, I bought four-tenths of an acre of land for 45000 put a nice billboard on it. 45000 is cheap. You know, when you think about it, you paid 10000 and every year, and that potentially goes up. This is mine. I control now. I've got another sign on it that I lease to someone else for seven hundred and fifty a month, which is cheap. But they're my air conditioning company, so they give me a discount, and I get seven fifty a month from. Yeah, them. but man, hearing those land prices, I mean, yeah. again, you know, like I said, I'm always looking for deals, yeah. and I could build storages from the ground up. Like I have the resources, yeah. but God, man, yeah. when you see land prices yeah. eight, seven, eight, nine dollars a square foot, yep. uh, especially in League City, there's mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, I want to say it was like five or six acres for, and they wanted $2.8 million for it. And I'm like, who's buying that and making that make sense? We sold public storage, one of our developments, Grand Parkway and, and Clay Road. We sold public storage, two acres or something, I don't remember exactly, $12 a foot. And they built a storage facility on it. Now it's, you know, it's multi-story and uh, like they do. But they paid twelve dollars a foot and tickled with the site. But I just, I just from me sitting at my desk trying to work out numbers of like, okay, concrete's eight nine dollars a square foot. Yep. These units are this much, you know, per unit. And then I look at the amount of time I would have to hold it. Yep. And then especially in that, and I'm trying to do something where I can do it cash. Yeah. And by the time, dude, if you got to go to the bank uh, and they no, say, oh, eight, nine it. percent. And public storage, you know, they're a public company and they've got a ton of money and their money's cheap. So they can do it and they're in it for the long haul. So you say their money's cheap. How do they, they just have such juice on Wall Street and stuff that they just get uh, I mean, private funding? Even if they're, you know, and, and who knows how they exactly raise the money. Public companies do it all different ways. But if they go to the market and raise money, it's cheaper than most of us most of the time. If they're a top-notch company, then 
where you might go to a bank and right now it costs you eight and a half percent. They're going to go to J.P. Morgan Chase, New York, and get it for five percent. Okay, that's just the difference in advantages of size and strength. Because you're not just some guy. You're you're huge. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I just um, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with with the commercial sector. I mean, like I said, any, anything I see on LoopNet because yeah. uh, commercial. It's all about it's interest versus price. Yeah. Um, how do you make a profit? Yeah. Everything's how do you make a profit? But I was talking to an agent the other day, a commercial agent. Uh, she said that she sells everything. She's like, yeah, we're still selling, and we have people that are just buying it on speculation. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, if you've got money to park and sit on, land rarely goes wrong. As far as one thing about real estate, <coughs> if you – Excuse me. If you overpack today, and if you can afford to hold it long enough, it'll nearly always come back, and yeah. you make money off of it. Now, I've had stockbrokers tell me the same thing about <laughs> stocks, and I don't. I'm not a Wall Street guy, so I don't I currently have almost no money in the stock market. My investments and what I've made my money in has always been real estate. So that's what I know. That's what I like. That's what I can figure out. But you know, if you have great deals of money you got to park it somewhere. Where do you park it? Some people like the stock market. Some people like land. Some people like buildings. Some people, you know, all of those things. Uh, so if you're having to borrow money, then land, carry costs will eat you up. But if you got excess money and you're just parking it in places and you're, and you're smart about where you put it, you get ahead of the growth, then, you, you know, you can be surprised how fast – It'll grow. My deal with raw land, though, is I look at some stuff and I'm like, okay, well, I could buy this. I could do it cash. But then I inherit a $10,000, $15,000 a year property tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, so do you look for exemptions on stuff, ag exemptions? I mean, there's not going to be a lot of that around here. If it's big enough, you can. I mean, we've bought land before for our developments that we had ag exemptions on. One of the strangest one we had, the government has a lot of screwy programs. Our biggest development that we've ever done, Grand Parkway, we sold Grand Parkway a mile and a half. They went right through the middle of our property great for us it created six great commercial corner lots but when we bought it it had an ag exemption and the guy that we leased the land to and the government paid him not to grow crops not to put animals on it so you know and i don't know he paid us 10 or twenty thousand a year and uh, we leased it to him <clears throat> and this was in place when we bought the property too, by the way. But we got the ag exemption because he was able to do that. And I, you know, I don't know what he made—a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand a year—by not growing anything and not putting any animals on the property. Talk about passive income. Talking about typical government. Yeah, basically. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it was a legitimate program that was created and he had a lot of land and he went to a lot of developers and set that program up yeah um so one more question about this 10x is easier than 2x book they talk about the principle of who not how and where you look at a problem that's kind of out of your wheelhouse and say how are we going to do this that's not what you do you say who can we bring on that can solve this problem so he this guy in the book says that basically if he encounters an issue uh, where there is someone he can talk to or hire that is a professional at whatever this problem is, he w- refuses to do it and he will hire them to do it. Is that, I mean, is that kind of a principle you more or less followed? I, you know, <clears throat> you have to leverage yourself first off to grow. Like we said earlier, you can double your business, just work twice as many hours. And we did that by the way, in the early days, Kathy and I did that. I mean, 100-hour weeks were my normal in the construction business and my first many years in real estate. So worked harder. But then as we started growing, I never added an employee. I didn't look to build a big team. When I had a need, then I looked for, okay, I need to hire somebody to take this over. It was either something I couldn't do, didn't want to do, wasn't good at, then yes, hire somebody to fill that position and then train them and turn it over to them. So yes, that's how you leverage yourself. And so we started, Kathy and I together, so we in a way we were already two of us immediately. And then within a year, we hired uh, our first assistant. And then 
you know, within less than a year, we hired our next assistant. But it was always because of growth and need. Right. It wasn't because I wanted to build this big team. <clears throat> and real estate teams now, first off, ours were all employees, too. We never hired an independent contractor. We hired employees. And, you know, that first employee that we hired, 30 years later, she was still working here. She retired a couple of years ago. Uh, the second one worked a few years, then she got married and had babies and left. The third employee we hired, she's still working at the real estate office here. Wow. She worked for about 12, 15 years. She left to spend more time with her kiddos. Five or six years later, she came back and has been here another 10 plus years. Yeah. So, you know, hiring good people, uh, training them correctly, and then letting them own it. As far as, you know, my job was to support them, give them the tools they need, and not. And the title company was different. We started the title company with five employees. When I sold it originally, you know, initially it had 175 employees. So it went from five to 175 in, in oh, 15 14 year, years, yeah. something like that. Uh, you, you know, and it was, I was lucky in many ways as far as just happened to find the right people. When the downturn hit in 2008, we were a small company. So big companies were cutting and laying off. I heard some of my best people in those times because we were five people. Yeah, and you, you wrote know? it. It was and up from we there. Wrote it from there, and then we kept those people, and then they appreciated it. So you know, I had my first employee when I started is still at the title company at Baytown, right? Uh, no, the first one was uh, Peggy Godell at our Cypresswood office. Okay, and uh, Baytown was my first office location. Peggy was actually working here. Uh, in this office building, she worked for First American. When I started Great American, she came over, yeah. continued to close our business. So she really worked for us for five years before yeah. handling our business. When I started the title company, when I sold it, she's still there. That's funny you say that but about not, you know, you train them and then let them own it. That's one thing in the book. He's like, don't go hire a bunch of people and then be over their shoulder the whole time because they'll eventually just hate you and quit. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's funny that you said that because... My first... My first employee if she was still around she'd tell you because it was in a small office i could hear everything and you know initially she'd take a call and say well here ronnie's here and she'd hand me and then i started saying no when there's a problem you're going to deal with it yeah i'm going to be here listen to you so she'd get a call she'd look at me and i would be listening and i'd be right over her shoulder and i'd write notes and i'd write comments and here's your answer i mean i could tell the questions and i would write to her and et cetera. But then that's how she learned yeah. to do it. And it wasn't long that she had the confidence to know, I can handle this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it was something terrible, if someone was extremely mad, which rarely ever happened, well, then, of course, I would take those calls. You can't hide from it. Yeah. I always was willing to do anything I'd ask an employee to do, I would be willing to do or had done myself. Right. If I was capable. Now, there are things I'm not capable of. Right. And so, yes, I hired people and I couldn't couldn't really train them the right way to do it because I didn't have that talent. If you ask me to sing a song, I can't do it. Some people are great at it. Yeah. Uh, the same thing with creative and artistic. I'm not that. So someone to design brochures, that wasn't me. That's not me either. No. So I had to hire someone. It, actually, Kathy did it initially, and then when she got busy, we hired someone else, Beth, Beth Level, that still works for the real estate company. Hired her at 18, 17, 17. And then, sorry, we got some background noise going on. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to shut this door. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. You can cut that one out. Huh? <laughs> We're good. Uh, but, um, you know, Beth, we hired, I think she was 17, and worked part-time while she was going to high school. And, you know, she's still here, and that's, that was in, 88 so what's that wow 35 years still yeah. there now she's a part owner in the company and she, you know i sold it seven years ago or so so she worked for me for 27 years yeah it's her only job real job she's ever had yeah because last time on the podcast you were telling me you were playing golf and uh one of your buddies was like you know ronnie you should start a title company and you said nah i got enough going on and yeah. but when you make that decision like all right we're doing this I wouldn't even know where to begin. I mean, you make you. What do you just make calls to people who are in the business? Or, I mean, what does that look like? You figure it out. You know, when you when you jump in, you suddenly learn to swim. You yeah, know? and uh, a lot of mistakes. It was it was a scenario of uh, yes, a, a 
good friend of mine that was had retired from first American title, as a matter of fact. He was division president. His last job was state president. And he kept saying, Ronnie, you should do it. Well, of course, he thought, he was thinking I'd do an ABA where, you know, okay, everybody else, you know, the title company would basically do all the work and I'd get part of the profits. And to me, that just never felt right. Right. So suddenly I'm going to be using the same people doing the same thing, but they're going to make less because now I'm taking money from them. That just didn't sound good to me. So when I finally, he finally taught me into it, he came in as a small owner. Originally, he had 10% ownership. Most of our business, the first two years, was our business, the real estate company's business and the development company's business. So we had built-in business. So that was the good news is we didn't have to, but we wanted to grow it. And so I had the Baytown office with two people. I had the office here with three people, and that was our five. And uh, actually, two people here, two people there, and a bookkeeper. So that was our five people that we started with. Uh, and was just looking for ways to grow because I was never going to make money. Matter of fact, my first two years, I lost money because even though we generated a lot of business and controlled a lot of it, still with the overhead and the title business is a complicated business. And and regulatory, I mean, the Department of Insurance, you know, for the first time I, I didn't realize that there was a report that had to be done every once a year at a certain time of the year. And it's supposed to be, you know, it's due, let's just say, October 1st. I don't remember the date. Well, we got it. I didn't even know about it till the day before. Worked with the bookkeeper. We put it together, and it's a financial report. I mean, they want to know down to fax costs, down to paperclip costs. I mean, it's very detailed. So it's like, okay, we put it together, dropped it in the mail, got it post off, marked the day of. I get a call the next day saying, hey, your report such and such is due. And I said, yes, sir, we got it. We dropped it in the mail yesterday. He said, no, it's supposed to be here yesterday. Like, I mean, you know, everything else – Income tax returns, everything, as long as it's postmark, it's okay. This was not okay. And I said, well, we put it in the mail yesterday. If you want, I'll drive a copy to you today. I'll leave. And where were they? Austin. Okay. Austin, Department of Insurance. And he said, no, but if I don't have it by tomorrow, you're getting another call. And I said, oh, and in the mail, thank goodness, and mail was better than it is now. So he did get it, and I followed up the next day and said, did you get it? Because I'm prepared to drive. I've got a copy. I'll drive it to you. And, uh, and it had to be original, too, by the way. It couldn't be. So I couldn't, couldn't fax it to him, couldn't email it to him. It had to be an original. Uh, I think that's changed now. But, I, I mean, those are the things that you don't know. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly it's like, okay, this is a real business with lots of rules. And then I was, like I say, as the economy turned, it actually gave us a chance to grow instead of shrink. We couldn't shrink. Heck, we were only five people. So we hired some more people. We ended up hiring a great HR and bookkeeping person. I ended up bringing another partner in that had a lot more title industry expertise than I did. Who, not how. And, and we all brew. Yep. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the mistakes I've made in my career is trying to be perfect too much. And I always do my best, you know, especially when I'm dealing with other people's assets and money. But, you know, like that's just something you didn't know. And that's just part of the journey of, hey, you're going to mess up. Like yeah. you just got to own it. Hey, let's make it right as best we can and move on. And now, but now, you know. You never miss that report again. No, nope, and that got assigned to somebody to do. Yep. As far as that way. And, you know, I mean, it's a great example. We all make mistakes. And and people understand that. If, if we make a mistake and we acknowledge it and make it right, you can actually turn it into a positive. But people that make mistakes and then deny it, hide about it, cover it up, run from it. Mm-hmm then it'll hurt you. It'll, it'll or blame you someone. Or blame someone else, et cetera, that way. I never asked an employee to lie for me. I never asked them to do anything that I wouldn't do because what am I showing them? If I'm, I mean, even as far as, you know, Ronnie's not here right now, and I was. Or, I mean, I took a phone call. If people called in the early days, I took every phone call and returned every phone call. Then as it grew and I stepped farther and farther back and got more diversified into other businesses, well, yes. Then I trained the people that when they called for Ronnie Matthews, you say, hey, I'm Ronnie Matthews' assistant. I'm Ronnie Matthews this. How can I help you? And 99% of the time, they could handle it. Yeah. The last five, six years, I was in the real estate business. I talked to maybe two clients a year. I, I navigated the boat. I ran the ship. I ran, managed the money. But I had people that were trying to do all the rest of it. Yeah. 
Man. So I, I took on a, an assistant last year for a short time. And, uh, I learned, <laughs> I learned a lot. I learned the importance of training, yep. you know, yep. taking, you know, I mean, now I, if I did the same thing again, I would have sat him down. I would have said, you be at the office every day this week. We're going to go through, I and mean, I would have trained him for like a week or two straight. Yep. <laughs> Some of the mistakes I had, I made with him was he had a full-time job. Yep. So, Hey, write this contract. Okay. I'll do it after work. That ain't going to work. No. No. Uh, temperament. He was a very... I, if I hire in another assistant, I want someone with energy. I want someone who, with almost uh, almost unrealistic ex, unrealistic kind of uh, optimism, that that type of personality. Um, I just I learned. I mean, and I know you've hired and had to you know get rid of certain people because it's not everybody's a fit. No. Not everybody's cut out for real estate. No. Um, I had someone the other day messaging me asking about you know I see you're in real estate. How can I get into it? And I told them everything, and they said, "How much are the classes?" I said, "A thousand dollars." Oh, that's too expensive. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. And in that case, they don't need to be in the business. Because no, <clears throat> the business is going to take a while to get an income growing. There's expenses that happen, et cetera. Hiring is a, a un, a, an interesting thing, and I've hired hundreds and hundreds of people over the years. My normal interview would be fifteen minutes. I wouldn't, you know, I see companies <clears throat> interviewing three and four times, and not to say that's wrong or not, I hired people that I felt like I could trust that had good attitudes. And then you can teach them almost anything. I hired, you know, there was a period of time I went through and hired some recent college graduates. And, you know, they were 22, 23, had never had a job before. We hired them as receptionists, and this has been seven or eight years ago at the title company. And in a period of about four years or four or five months, we hired, I think, three different ones. None of them lasted 90 days. Uh, half of them quit after two weeks. Just, and, and by the way, quit, didn't show up. There's I mean, no show. Period, just didn't call, didn't quit. They just didn't show up. Uh, and others that we had to left because, you know, if they've never had a job, they're in college, they're out of college now, they got some BS degree, well, they're not trained to do anything. And they haven't been trained to know that, hey, your hours are 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. That means you need to be here ready to answer the phone before 8 a.m. At 7.50. Yeah. yeah. You need to be here, whatever you need to do, go to the bathroom, get your coffee, do all of that, and the phone starts ringing at 8 o'clock. You need to hit the button and it rings. And you're here till 5 o'clock at least, and when you hang up, then you round up your stuff and you leave. You don't come to work and two weeks later ask, well, I need off this Friday at 2 because I want to do XX. Well, you know, if there's anybody going to get off Friday at 2, it's people that have been here. Yeah. It's not you. You haven't earned the right to get off early. Now, if it's an emergency or something different that way. But, you know, those are little things that you do. But if you hire someone with the right attitude, then they can learn almost anything. If you hire someone that has positive attitudes and the right attitude and willing and wants to learn, wants to do things, well, then they can go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll just say I, I think the generation coming up, they have a whole different perspective on, I don't know. I mean, they've probably seen their parents work at a corporate gig at a big company and just be miserable. And so they have this attitude of what can the what can the employer do for me? Mm -hmm. And yep. You know, it's different, and, and I feel like kids jump around a lot more now. Yep. Uh, there's very rarely do you see a guy start at a company when they're 20 years old and retire there. Yep. Like, I just feel like that's kind of getting to be... And that's employees and companies. You know, unfortunately, there's some of that that goes both ways. And, you know, I've been through stretches where I had to lay off people. Uh, you know, the title business, you know, one time we had 175. By the time I left, we had 135. Because the economy just changed, yep. and, and we had to make changes. And that's hard. Uh, you know, there's always a few. It's like, okay, this is not a very good employee. I can cut this one, cut this one. But after a point, you get to, and, th and they need their job, you know. So I always tried to be the last person that ever did layoffs because, you know, I can suck it up. And through 2008, nine, and 10, we didn't lay off anyone at the real estate company or at the title company. The title company, like I say, we grew. But at the real estate company, I wasn't making any money, but those people were counting on my check 
a lot of them, their husbands had lost their jobs, so yeah. it was even more important to them. You were just kind of floating? I just made less, and thankfully I had saved money and, and was in a situation where I didn't have to have a regular check coming in. Yeah. And things always turn around. But that's also why when I sold the company and I sold it to the employees, and, you know, at that time there was seven owners, and all of them been with me more than 15 years, and, uh, you know, in some more than 20 years at that point. That's why they stayed because, yes, I may not have been the highest paying, but they always knew I would take care of them. They always knew I was there for them. They always know I'd treat them with respect. And if they got into buying, I was there to help. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, that's hearing you say that, you know, those years you made less and you just had to suck it up for a little yeah. bit. I've, I've had the delusion of myself of, hey, every year I need to be growing. Mm -hmm. Every year I'm going to make more. And it's not like, I mean, if you look at it over, I'm sure 30 years from now, if I look at the graph, it'll be up and then, down. Yeah. but overall it's up. Yeah. But there is those years that, man, I mean, those, extra, this year has made me realize how vulnerable the real estate industry is to market conditions. It is. I mean, it's, it's all about the market. I, I always, it's funny because people talk about writing down goals and their expectations and checking every week or every month to their goals. I never wrote down a goal in my life. I never started January 1st thinking, okay, last year I did 50 million. This year I want to do 60 million. You never did a vision board? I never did a vision board. I just expected to do more. And that's the thing is, it was just a built-in expectation of myself. I was going, but by the same token, I knew I was going to work as hard as I could. I knew I was going to do everything that I possibly could to be successful and to grow business. If it didn't happen... Well, it wasn't because I didn't try. Yeah. It's because, and in, in every year over my 30-year real estate period, yes, it it was up, up, up. But there were flat years, maybe even a couple, yeah, matter of fact, 2009 was probably a down year. 2010 may have been a down year, but then it turned back up. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, our first year we sold 51 homes. My last year that I was in the real estate business, we sold 13 or 1,400. So... That was a pretty good growth path. That's like four or five a day. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact. Well, pretty close to four business hours, days, four even more. Yeah. 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 Seven days a week, 365 days a year, roughly four a day. That's ridiculous. That if you like, that doesn't even seem, I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> you know, it was, it was first off, we had diversity in where our business came from. <clears throat> we had what we called our regular business. We had, uh, our relocation business, we had our builder business, and then your buyer's agent business. So, you know, there was kind of four different channels. And over the years, some years, you know, builder business would be the biggest, and another year maybe our relocation business was. Uh, there was one year, uh, 2012, I think it was my biggest year ever, we got, you know, it, it, it's taking care of people. So this is a great story, I think. And we had a property management guy that we would refer business to. Super nice guy, did a good job. Property management is tough business. I didn't want anything to do with Me it. Me neither. And so when we'd have somebody that needed it, I would just send it to him. And he'd say, Ronnie, you know, every time you do, I'll make sure if they sell, it comes back to you, and I'll pay you $500. And I told him, yes, when they get ready to sell, I'd appreciate, you know, directing it back. They probably are going to call me anyway because I'm going to stay in touch with them. But don't, I don't want a referral. You know, if you can charge them less, great, charge them less. If, but I want you to make a profit. I want you to do well and take good care of them. That's the main thing, take good care of them. And so, you know, five, six, seven years later, he called me one day and said, hey, I've got a fund. Our group in Dallas is working with selling them houses, but here we don't do sales. And it's a hedge fund. They're looking to buy houses. Well, over the next 18 months, sold them 750 homes. Oh, my gosh. So, those buyer agents were busy. <laughs> well, no, even better than that. One person was able to handle it because it's a hedge fund overseas. They had certain guidelines. We plugged it into the system, and MLS would run it, send them a potential report. And by the time we got to work every morning, it was like, okay, we like these three. Would you make offers on these three? So literally one employee in the office did all 750 of those transactions. Dang. They came to town twice. I spent a day and a half both times with them, driving them around, driving by some of their properties, driving by areas, and that was it. 
Seminary of Indiana. But that came from that guy. He knew lots of realtors. He called us, and he called us because I was worried about him. I, feel, I wasn't squeezing him for every dollar. Right, yeah. I, I feel like this game is – I've just seen situations where I've, like, seen that – I, I could just see how if you make one good contact with someone like that, like it takes one, mm-hmm. maybe throughout your career, you meet five guys like that yep. and it can really propel you. Yep. yep. Our relocation business was somewhat similar story of relocation for Chevron. So she goes out there. He works with us as far as I want y'all to handle Houston relocations. And so we started getting some deals and the company uh, really fought it as far as they had their people they wanted. They didn't want, you know, to go with us. But he said, no, you're going to do it. And then a year and a half later, he moves back to Houston. So then it really became amped up. And so he just told him, period, anything in Houston is going to go to Ronnie and Kathy Matthews. They're the best realtors. They helped me here. They helped me in California. They helped. So <clears throat> then we get to finally get a relocation lady. And then she leaves there, and she goes to work for Halliburton. So for the next six, seven years, Mona was the Halliburton lady. She referred us almost every Halliburton transaction. So taking that call on a Sunday afternoon that a lot of people wouldn't have done, yep. ended up easily a thousand homes oh over the next God. over the next you know fifteen years. Just one call that you know you take it, you take advantage of it, you do a good job, you make an impression, bam, and that's what it leads to. And that just shows that how much of a volume game real estate is because if you just talk to enough people. Yep. I mean, yep. you're going to find, you'll just run into that one person that randomly has a connection yep. that you never know and where stuff goes. In there. And, you know, it's one of those things. I never call it a game because it's not game, it's business. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have to talk to as many people as possible. You have to work with as many people as possible. You have to get the word out to as many people as possible. But it's never a game. It's always serious. It's always business. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, it's – and if you're going to grow and you're going to make a good income and you're going to take care of yourself and your family and all those things, then, yes, you have to do volume. You have to do a lot of business to really make a strong, strong income. And I've been very fortunate. Real estate's been great for us and turned us into where we, you know, now could live very comfortably and never do anything again. Yeah. Yep. Now you don't have to get – even sell you just oh, no i don't i don't want to go back into sales oh, when, when you said you're you're like yeah, i'll be at the office i was like he still goes into the office yep. yeah but i still my schedule even though you know march 1st don't, i don't have a job anymore uh, but but i'm still in business i still have lots of things going on i still need the structure of and, and by the way i don't work from home i mean yes i work at home but i get up and go to the office so i'm either in the office, appointments like we had today. I've got another one this evening at 5.30. And this is, you know, a mortgage guy that did a lot of business with us at the title company. You know, he called me, just he wants to talk, advice, and discuss the real estate world and things too, sort of like what we're doing. Yeah. There's no, I mean, I'm not going to make anything from this. I don't think. You never know. Yeah. This for us. But, you know, he's helped me in the past. He was there for us. So certainly I'm going to meet him. You know, absolutely I'm going to meet him. And I, I've definitely, not that I'm anywhere close to, you know, giving advice to people or coaching anybody or anything like that, but I've definitely found that I I enjoy when someone is first getting into the business and they ask me questions. Because I, I remember when I got in the business and I did have a couple people that I could lean on, but I, if I could have had that, you know, a guy that's, you know, 10 years older than me that could say, man, do this, don't do this, don't do this. Mm-hmm. Before I, I was on the way here and I drove through the co- uh, Black Rock Coffee by my house and I uh, had the camera in the front seat. So I drove through and the kid said, I, Americano? I said, yeah, I grabbed my coffee. He said, what's with the camera? I said, I'm on the way to do a podcast. He said, for what? I said, uh, real estate. And he said, oh, really? Do you like real estate? And I said, <laughs> yeah, I like real estate. And he said, I'm taking my pre-licensing classes, right? I mean, this kid's 19, 20 yeah. years old. Yeah. And I gave him my card. I said, bud, here, if you need anything in the future, call me. I wish I would have had someone, yeah. you know, to kind of lean on. But yeah. I just, I've, I enjoy it. I enjoy talking to, get, to people. Well, like, you're outgoing, you're friendly. And, you know, that's a good basics to start in. Now you got to follow it up with the work. And, and you just never, I mean, he may end up never getting licensed, but if his parents, he's probably might be living at home and, Right. They might want to sell the house. Hey, I met this nice guy, yep. you know, at work. Yep. You just never know. Yeah. So yeah, odds are he, 
won't get into real estate really because it's well, like that, a lot you, harder than they think. Where, where were you uh, speaking at that place and you told them 80% <laughs> yeah. y'all won't be in the business and they didn't invite you back? <laughs> yeah, I, I spoke at one of the, we'll leave it nameless, but one of the schools at real estate and I'd speak there every few years. They'd ask me to come by. And so one day I was there, just happened to be there and they drug me into class and, you know, asking questions. And, and I don't remember what the question was, but I said, look, <laughs> 80% of you in this class won't be in real estate five years from now. Yeah. Well, I did not get asked back yeah. to speak to. Still friends with the owner and all of those well, things. Well, how dare you tell the truth? I, well, mean, I mean, especially now. And they're, and it's not their fault whether we succeed or not. Yeah. Uh, you, there's a school there for a reason because there's a demand for it. And there's classes that haven't been taken, and they do a good job of what they do. Yeah. That doesn't nearly train you, qualify you to be a successful realtor. Right. Well, man, we're already over an hour. I know you got things to do today, so I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for having me at the office. And maybe in another two years, we'll do it again. Always, All right, always a pleasure. Thank pleasure. you, sir. You bet. Congratulations.